When I was about seven years old, I discovered a box with old science magazines from the 1960s. The covers had drawings of flying cars, automated food processors, robots helping in the household, and much more. These texts believed that technology would help us solve all problems. And while that obviously wasn't and still is not true, the positivity around technology, the curiosity and the inventiveness of these articles have never stopped fascinating me. For 20 years, I applied digital technology to logistics processes, closely looking at how things are run without digital tools, finding new ways of doing them with digital solutions. I founded a software company that focused on making logistics processes paperless. I made those businesses more efficient, their processes faster, leaner, and cheaper, optimizing them to maximum performance, all the while using up my own resources until I burned out. In the following year, I took a long, hard look at what effects the solutions I had helped building had had and came to the conclusion that I can do better, that we as IT professionals can do better than just optimizing performance. Today, I'd like to convince you that we do not have to wait for the next tech breakthrough, that the digital tools we already have can help greatly in solving real-world issues if we set the right goals, if we focus on applying these tools to the right issues. But that also means that we have to know about the possibilities digital transformation offers us. We have to know them, their potential, the risks they might pose, and we have to discuss them together, deciding what we want to achieve with them. I am convinced that digital transformation is the single most powerful force affecting our world today. It will only keep accelerating and we need to talk about it. We coders, programmers, nerds tend to play around with technology, see what is possible and then just do. We are fascinated by the sheer possibility of doing new things, sometimes overlooking that our next bright idea has real world consequences or that our customers might have other goals than we do. Let me give you an example of that. Think of ride-sharing apps like Uber or Lyft. The technology is undeniably great. The apps are well-executed examples of combining mobile computing with GPS, centralized data storage, and a uh, effortless rating system. Then again, if you're a cab driver in New York City, you might not find those services too great for you. Because you had planned to sell the license you have been working on most of your life and that is bolted into your cab as your financial plan for retirement. The value of that license was at a maximum worth roughly 1 million US dollars in 2013. Today, where everyone with a car and a mobile phone can become an Uber or Lyft driver, it is worth about $70,000, having lost more than 90% of its value. A great software idea accidentally destroyed the retirement plans of 14,000 cab drivers in New York City alone. And I'm pretty sure by meaning they are disruptive, those coders were not aiming for civil unrest. One more example. Now consider that we are on the brink of autonomous cars and trucks and think about what that might mean. It sounds great and will probably help avoid accidents, make transports more efficient and use way less resources. But also keep in mind that truck driver is the most popular job in 29 states in the United States, totaling about 3.5 million truck drivers. Concepts like platooning, where only the lead vehicle of a truck platoon still has a human driver and up to nine trucks can be daisy-chained by wireless connections to this, would mean that you need 90% less drivers. So we might want to talk about this before we implement it. As you can see, the main drivers in industrial digital tools today are cost, time and user resources. The main driver in customer-centric digital solutions is convenience. Take the grandmasters of convenience, the big online shopping outlets. We have gotten used to receiving any product we want within 24 hours. It is just one click away, which is actually patented. If we don't like it, we can send it back at no cost, which leads to people ordering three different sizes and two colors and sending back 70% of their order. In metropolitan areas, you can now have same day or even one hour delivery. That is, among other tools, achieved by so-called predictive delivery. Software looks at what will most likely be ordered in a specific area this day, and the predicted amount is loaded onto the car before it's actually ever ordered. Amazon sends out trucks with a fill rate below 80% because their stated mission is to deliver as fast as possible to you. And they will even accept running half-empty trucks to achieve that goal. 
Whole software companies were founded to give the delivery driver access to your home without you having to worry, resulting in digital door lock solutions with camera monitoring. We as citizens might complain about lots of empty stores in our inner cities. We might complain about streets that are clogged with delivery trucks from seven different parcel services. We might even overhear the discussions about how bad the job as a delivery driver is in payment, treatment, hours. But our convenience trumps all that. I believe that cannot be undone. Anyone asking customers to sacrifice this convenience will fail. Any solution that wants to be successful needs to be as convenient for the user as possible. Now think about what would be possible if we aimed our digital tools at efficient, fast, lean processes, keeping customer convenience at the center of attention, focusing all that programming power, this creativity, those resources, but with an ethical compass. Deciding not only what would be most efficient and convenient, but what would be the right thing to do. I believe that that is possible. Let me show you two real-world issues that could be solved simply by deciding to tackle them with existing digital tools. This is a photo I took a few years back when I was riding on a bread delivery truck in the Frankfurt metropolitan area to digitize their delivery process. The sign above that conveyor belt reads, no meat or sausages. That conveyor was built to transport the waste bread for processing. Now, waste bread in that case meant that at every stop where we delivered fresh bread, we took packaged bread back with us that was nearing or over its best before date. When we returned to the warehouse, we parked the truck at that belt and dumped all that bread onto it. It is then transported to a machine that separates it from the packaging, shreds it and turns some of it into animal food and some for thermal reuse, aka it's burned for heat. The daily amount of waste bread at this facility alone is about two tons. Why so much? Because the supermarkets want to make sure that their customers never find an empty shelf, that you as a customer will always find your preferred brand of toast. Their worst fear is that you might go to a different store because you did not find sunflower seed bread today. Now, a few years back, I also worked for a company in the Netherlands that restocked cigarette vending machines. The worst fear of any tobacco company is that you try to buy your preferred brand from the machine and that slot is empty. So that you might change to a different brand and maybe be lost as a returning customer. So they set out to eliminate that data. They started collecting data from the machines. When was which brand sold from a specific machine? Where is that machine placed? What is the average rage on a Thursday night in that club? What kind of music is played there at night? What was the weather like that day? Was it a holiday in that region? Was there a city party going on? Many more data points. All of that was put into a software which had only one goal. Make sure that each specific brand is never empty. And we succeeded. In above 93% of the cases, the next action on a specific machine after someone had brought the last box of a specific brand was the restocking. That was achieved 15 years ago without AI, deep learning or other science fiction tools that had still to be invented at that time. Now imagine if you'd apply that old school software solution to bread restocking instead of cigarettes. Finding out which bread will be needed how often in that specific store by data analysis. Why has that not been done yet if the technology is available? Because bread is much cheaper than cigarettes. The motivation to come to another solution is just not the same. It is cheaper to run a conveyor belt to process that waste than to invest in a software solution that could help avoid it altogether. Luckily, that goal seems to begin to change. Now let me jump back to convenient online ordering, vacant shops, stuffed streets and badly paid delivery drivers. I have spent a good part of my professional life shaving off a few percent in transport margins, in time, in speed. But what we need for this problem is a way bigger approach, and it is possible with even less technology, but just one decision. This is the status quo. Online deliveries are picked up from the sender's warehouse, transported to central hubs, to local hubs, and then get distributed by smaller vans locally. Most of those parcel services work with subcontractors, some even with sub subcontractors. And in order to enable them to become part of the digital ecosystem of that parcel service, they already have a plethora of interfaces in place. Now, knowing about these processes and interfaces and looking at it with the goal of reducing traffic, maybe reducing emissions, creating less stressful delivery jobs, 
and at the same time enabling the inner city local shops to be able to compete with the online giants, you can create sustainable last mile delivery. You just have to change one part of this process. You make them all go through a centralized local delivery hub. That means that all those online orders are still delivered from warehouse to hub, but then to that localized hub. On the last mile, this is consolidating all deliveries for the region in one delivery service putting parcels from DHL, UPS, FedEx, GLS and all others in one delivery vehicle for one part of town. This immediately results in less vehicles in the inner cities because you and your neighbors will be serviced by the same vehicle regardless of which parcel carrier you and your neighbors order was originally transported on. It immediately enables the local shop to offer local same-day delivery of goods they have in store without having to establish their own infrastructure and the next day delivery directly to their customers by using the system, pre-labeling the delivery for that specific customer, just like the online beer must do. Suddenly, local shops are as quick as Amazon local delivery, or maybe even quicker. This idea allows for a delivery vehicle mix that is specific for its region. And as this is a decision the community will make, it will also be able to determine other parameters of this service, like using only emission-free vehicles on the last mile like setting a livable wage for the delivery drivers on the last mile as a minimum standard, not exchanging them every six weeks like it happens now. This could also mean that those drivers know their delivery area, know the people there, know that you, when you're not home, want your packages delivered to your left neighbor because picking them up at your right neighbor means you have half an hour of small talk ahead. What amazes me about digital tools applied to real-world problems is that they sometimes open up completely new possibilities once you start working on them. In this case, once you take that sustainable last mile as a given, you can easily add more ideas to it. Local shops could, for example, use reusable co packaging containers made from recycled plastics in different sizes that are picked up the next time you receive a delivery, effectively eliminating the need for another cardboard packaging around the original box in local transport, reducing paper use immensely. Unified packing stations that allow customers a convenient pickup can suddenly be filled regardless of who the original carrier was. You could even think about further reducing traffic by using the local bus lines that drive a specific route every day anyway to haul trailers that have been loaded with the packages for this delivery area, turning the last mile into the last 250 meters with even smaller vehicles, maybe bikes. You can think of combining Meals on Wheels services that cater to nursing homes, schools or other institutions to also carry their parcels on that daily delivery. You can think of educating the drivers to also check in on the elderly, not as caretakers, but as friendly face once a day that checks in on you and finds out if you're well. And all of that is possible without some new alien future technology, but with IT tools that we have at hand right now, aimed at a specific set of problems and supported by an informed decision. So why are we not doing this anywhere? because most people do not know about the power of digital transformation. There are expert forums, science conferences, online discussion forums, but most people do not know or care about these topics. It is not publicly discussed. This slide shows you the headlines for all major talk shows in Germany's main TV stations in 2019. The important issues are there, climate change, Brexit, populism and so forth. Digital transformation does not make it onto the list. I believe it should be up there right with climate change and what we'd like our society to be. As you can see, the seven-year-old boy in me who found the science magazines still believes that technology, and especially the digital transformation, holds one key for us to solve our problems, big and small. If we know what is possible with technology, which means we have to invest in education and science, once we know, we must then discuss with each other what we want to do with it and what not. And when that decision has been made, let us implement one problem at a time. That will take time, but what I'd like to ask of you today, right now, is Look at problems in your work or private life. Talk to your inner nerd or find one. Discuss if there are digital tools that could help solve that problem. Maybe you already know a problem that could benefit from a digital approach. They do not have to be the big things. Every single good solution counts. And please make sure you're heard. Engage in discussions. Help others in deciding what should be done. Then we will be able to use digitization to all our benefit. Solving real-world issues with your ideas and digital principles will make the world a little better, one problem at a time.